Hello and welcome to Consciousness Central, the daily show from the Science of Consciousness Conference 2017, coming to you from La Jolla in beautiful Southern California. I'm your host, Nick Day. Join me for the next four days of programming with news, interviews, a visit to the poster sessions, musical numbers, and all things to do with consciousness. Welcome. So uh, what brings you to the conference? What are you excited about? Uh, it's kind of about consciousness and I'm here to try to see what's the relationship between consciousness and economics because economics is a hard thing and but probably there is no lot of consciousness in it. Uh, and you came all the way from Italy to... Yeah, uh, yeah. First I have to present my conference about free will and an agency and second I come here to find more, question, more questions from from which I could learn more about consciousness. So what brings you here uh, to the conference? Um, I'm a neuroscientist. I've worked on Alzheimer's disease. I'm also a philosopher and uh, this is the first time I'm so excited that neuroscience and uh, consciousness studies have been merged and uh, I believe the quantum physics, uh, quantum particles is the only way to explain about the consciousness. <laughs> I'd like to welcome to Consciousness Central Peter Fennick. Peter Fennick is a long-term researcher into dying and near death. Uh, and Peter, where are you working these days? What's going I'm on? I'm fortunately emeritus, mm -hmm. but I was working at the Institute of Psychiatry and King's College in London. But then I also, in fact, worked for a little while in Oxford and in St. Thomas's Hospital in London. So I've been around a bit. Wonderful. So I suppose the whole subject of death and dying is something that for most people they tend to try to keep away from, particularly in our culture. We're not terribly close to it. We try to keep it at arm's length. Uh, you have spent an, a long, long time now very close to observing and studying, researching. How does near death and death, what does that inform us about the study of consciousness? Yes. This is a really interesting question. It's one of the questions of our time uh, because we're all going to die. I'm sorry about that, but we're all going to die. And so we actually have to accept that. And I mentioned, I see that you mentioned the word dying. It's actually quite unusual for people to do that. And the reason for that is we're scared stiff, we're frightened, and our culture does everything it can to reinforce that. First of all, just turn on TV, you get adverts uh, telling you how you can preserve your body. Um, but what we don't realize is that not talking about consciousness, not uh, uh, dying, in fact changes the metric of the culture we're in. And the Dalai Lama was very clear on this. He says, cultures which don't talk about dying are more greedy, people are more angry, and people are much more self-centered because you can go on collecting and collecting and collecting and without end, but it's not like that. So what, what is there about dying then that's of interest? I came to it because I was looking at near-death experiences now, I was very fortunate in that I did a television program in the UK in 1987. And it was the first program to go out on near-death experiences, and we got 2,000 letters. So I took 500 of those, and that provided a very good sample of near-death experiences. And I learned one thing. They can occur in any situation. There's an enormous fuss about near-death experiences in the academic literature because what I felt at that time, and what a lot of people have followed up, is that if you want a brain explanation of near-death experiences, then you must know what state the brain's in. And so cardiac arrests were a prime target because there's no, we know there's no brain function in cardiac arrest. And so uh, those experiences had to be uh, one of the deepest ones uh, as you approach death. 
And uh, we all know what they are, going down the tunnel, meeting a being of light, going into a spiritual realm, meeting dead relatives, maybe getting a life review. Uh, and then uh, you know if you go further, you'll die. And then you are back in your bed again, or whatever. Very little return journey. So has that got anything to do with dying? Or is it just a construct of the mind? Or, as materialistic science says, it's just a construct of the brain? Well, the answer to that is let's look at dying and see if it has got anything to do with dying or not. And so when I looked at dying, I found that there is a whole process to dying. And uh, we are so frightened that we don't look at it. And I started this in about 2000. And now we're where, 2017. Um, other people, fortunately, have taken it up. And there is a very, very good book published by Monica Rentz in Switzerland, which uh, takes it really uh, to a different level. And so what I'm going to do is just tell you, if you would like, about the dying process. Yes, certainly. Let's. It starts with, in a few people, premonitions. Uh, you get information that you're going to die. This is before you get the diagnosis, for heaven's sake. Suddenly it comes into your mind that you're going to die, or you'll have a dream which will be forceful and tell you you're going to die. If you listen to the Dalai Lama, he says everybody, uh, two years before they die, get information that they're going to die. And if you read his books about how this comes, it comes in a change in behavior, and it comes in a change in how you breathe. Now, I don't understand what that means, but that's what he says. In other words, there is information out there that you're going to die. Well, you get your diagnosis, and you go into the hospice. Then what? Well, we now know that there are a whole set of experiences that you can get. And I want you to think about yourself particularly, or the audience to think about themselves, what is going to happen to you that moment that it really gets home to you that you're going to die? You're going to be fearfully afraid and you're not wanting to go. Why? Because you are so attached. Attached to your wife, attached to your kids, attached to your house, all the career opportunities you're missing, all that sort of thing, to the world, in fact. And it's this attachment which are going to mark your progress th through dying itself. Uh, Monica has defined three stages, pre-transition, transition, and post-transition, but I'll go into those in a moment. But two weeks, three weeks before you die, you may get uh, visits from your relatives. Uh, in the study we did, we looked at 100 uh, deathbed visions, and the people who came were um, mainly first-degree relatives. Parents were very common. Dead spouses were common. Uh, very few grandchildren, but that's not surprising because they should be alive, <laughs> not dead. So you only see dead people. And uh, they are very welcoming and supportive and helpful. They'll come into the room. They'll even sit on your bed. Why sit on your bed? Because it's very comforting. If you're lying there knowing you're going to die and having your mum come and uh, hold your hand or say something to you, it's something which is comforting unless you had a terrible relationship with your mum, and then I don't expect she'll be there, there'll be somebody else. So it, it's, it's matched for what, you, what is helpful to you. Spiritual beings in our culture, yes, occasionally, angels, 3% only, very rare. So it's mainly dead relatives who come, animals, one or two. And uh, then you go on to the next phase, and this is what everybody must know and understand, and that is that you go into a different reality. You go into a different reality. If you're going to die conscious, which is what you should persuade your physicians to do, then you have a, a much better chance of going into this new reality. What's it like? It's like that of the near-death experience. Light, dead relatives, spiritual beings, light, love, support. It's really pleasant. 
And uh, in one or two studies now which have been done with people dying of cancer, about 90% of people do. So chances are you will go into that area. Now you come to your first hurdle because you have seen on the one hand what you are told is where you may be going. And on the other hand, you just don't want to go. And so you now have a choice. And I'd like all your listeners to understand this and study this, because if you want to die well, use your knowledge of the choice. Give everything up, everything. You've got to give up, obviously, all your ambitions. They're not going to be any good. But you've got to give up those very cl close relationships too, because if you don't, you'll be held back by these people as the dying process continues. So it's a question of giving up, giving up, giving up. Not everybody manages it. And they have really hard times they go through the dying process because there's a pull and a pull and a pull, and they don't want to let go and proceed. Let's assume that you get through that phase and you give everything up then you get, go into transition. Transition is a sort of intermediate stage between when you actually start dying. And then you go into post-transition. And this is why it is totally fascinating. Because the evidence is that you then go into a different level of consciousness. It's called non-dual consciousness. We're beginning to understand a lot of what non-dual consciousness means, and you don't have to be dying to go into it, but if you are dying then, and doing it properly, you will go into non-dual consciousness. And non-dual consciousness means that you become part of the universe, so you lose a lot of the characteristics uh, that you had as an individual. Uh, you lose your narrative self, that little bit you which talks to yourself all the time that goes you become supremely happy and you are just in the present nothing else so there's no fear of what's coming you're just there but you are in fact not you you're now part of a universal being and this will go on until you actually die well how do I know that I know it because of what people say when they go into that state. And I can argue from what they, their descriptions are to the um, state that we're beginning to understand in consciousness research, which is uh, movement into non-duality. So you become non-dual and then you die. So this very much sounds like a sp very a spiritual approach or a spiritual interpretation of a physical or experiential process. And I think perhaps a lot of people might feel enormously reassured by what you're saying. Perhaps those who've had some Buddhist training will find this non-attachment or letting go perhaps a bit <laughs> easier. easier. Easier, that's probably why the Dalai Lama says, <laughs> <laughs> pay attention. Um, but th this seems to be an enormously sort of hopeful and positive and very, very joyful um, interpretation of what we as a culture if consider could, the dreadful thing, absolutely. the worst thing. If you can do it properly, yes. but you've got to do it properly. Right. So can, we, can you extrapolate from that something about the universal nature of consciousness? Is, does that become where we go with this? Is it, does yes. it tell us something that in the science of consciousness that we can start to make some statement or at least proposition? Yes, I think so. Um, because I talked about non-dual consciousness, and one of the cutting edge, edges of consciousness research is in fact non-dual consciousness now. Uh, and your uh, viewers should look up Jeffrey Martin uh, on the web. And Jeffrey has a program which he calls his Finders program, which is in essence uh, just a, a number of methods that you can try to I'll use the word awaken or breakthrough. In other words, give up your limited subject-object consciousness, which we're in now. I'm a subject, it's me, you're an object. And that consciousness goes, and in non-duality, all that at part of your consciousness goes completely. And in his finders courses, he's finding that if people really work hard in them, 
then I, I don't know what his current figures are, but it's between 30 and 40 percent can enter non-dual consciousness. So it's a state of consciousness which is readily available. Obviously, if you're in this when you die, you don't mind it. Uh, you don't mind the dying process because you're already part of what is, just part of the universe. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. It's been uh, uh, a wonderful conversation and thanks again. We'll hopefully see you at a future Science of Consciousness conference with more insights into the nature of death and the nature of light. Thank you. That is Peter Fennick. Great. Thank yeah. you very much. What are you excited about seeing this week? Uh, really, you know, I'm, I'm pretty novice just in the field of consciousness in general. I, I work with sleep disorders here and sleep is a state of an altered state of consciousness that we go through every day and it, it just really strikes my interest to learn more about just more of the I guess the, the physics of sleep and really what that means on a conscious level versus how I how I approach it in um, in like the medical field. I'm excited to learn about uh, biological uh, implications of consciousness especially evolutionary that's what I do ah. evolutionary biology okay so uh, did you already see uh, some promising stuff in the first I day saw an absolutely brilliant presentation just now ended um, Roger Penrose and Yoshi Bach and uh, can't remember the third and Naven, yeah. yes yes yeah. god it was fabulous <laughs> So now on Consciousness Central, I am delighted to welcome Dorian Electra over here on my left and Qualiatic, aka Ariel Herman, next to me here. And as you may have seen um, from previous Consciousness Central editions, Dorian has provided um, a lot of very interesting consciousness related musical entertainment. This is a music video with real intelligence and thought. Ariel, we're going to have to see her music video shortly after this interview. So welcome both of you. Yesterday we, we did our workshop with art, and art is very much part of our sort of human condition. It seems mm -hmm. to be somehow intrinsic or inherent to, to being human. Um, you, both of you, have um, somehow adapted or brought the subject of consciousness into your art. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, I like to take questions about consciousness or in my recent work history and the history of science and um, and put it to music and images that make it accessible to lay people to take these ideas that I find fascinating out of the academic context where they're not very accessible to the average person and then make it super flashy and and understandable and mm -hmm. relatable to you know a lay person um, and give it like a pop culture injection and make it relevant to, you know, today's music and kids, youth, you know, want to mm -hmm. get the youth interested in these kinds of things. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's really interesting and, and, and a little bit like what we were talking about yesterday at the workshop, I feel like that's a very interesting dichotomy between our work where your work does an amazing job of focusing on how it can affect like many people and how it can bring these concepts to many people and create these understandings. Uh, my work, and I feel like my responsibility as an artist, just based on the way that I think, is a very like introspective thing. Like by delving into my own kind of thoughts and, and philosophies and like analyses within myself, and trying my best to communicate those into like the most honest, like fullest form of, of like a multimedia work that you can experience. Like I want to help people raise questions about their own consciousness and their own emotions and their own psyche. And I think, I mean, something that I really hope to accomplish through that is, is like a growth in empathy between people. And also like technology is something that's, that plays a big role in my work. Like a goal of mine is to bring kind of interactive EEG based like, um, like neuroplasticity related experiences into an audiovisual experience and something that's like very specific and therapeutic for individual people. Uh, and I don't know, with, with my work, I hope that people can experience like their own consciousness in a really intimate way and kind of like sit a little closer with themselves and pry into themselves a little more deeply because I think technology can kind of pull you from that. Um, and, and also there are just so many questions now with like AI and, and technology moving so quickly. There's, I think there's something that's really important about what makes us 
human emotionally and like in terms of consciousness too. And I hope to kind of create dialogue about that. Thank you very much to Dorian Electra, Ariel Herman, AKA Qualiatic. <laughs>
uh, a machine could indeed become conscious. It would just you would you would make it conscious by giving it the capability of uh, remembering that it had been conscious in the past. So it's a kind of tricky but very uh, clever and sophisticated yes. uh, argument that he gave. Then uh, Harmut Neven. Uh, talked about uh, Google's quantum biology, quantum computing research. Um, they've been working for years to develop a quantum computer, and they've got a computer uh, chip right now that has like 22 qubits in it. So it can do uh, a lot of computations very quickly. And so they're trying to program the, uh, these quantum computers to uh, do tasks that would take a normal computer years or decades, or maybe uh, it would be impossible for a classical computer to, to do these calculations. So they've been working with Intel, and they've been uh, the company, and with uh, the Department of Energy to kind of fine tune the, the task that they're asking their computer to do. And then when the quantum computer comes up with a solution, then they send it to the supercomputers at Intel and at the Department of Energy, and they sort of check its work. And, and see you know, uh, if it only took one second for this quantum computer to come up with a solution, how long would it take the supercomputers? And so uh, Nevin uh, looked forward to a near future when they'll have a, a more powerful quantum chip. And then it will be able to do, uh, it'll, be, it'll be able to do very interesting things like uh, error correction. And they think that that'll be useful for like solar uh, energy, for battery research, for a whole number of emerging technology industries. They think that they could use uh, Google's quantum computer chips to then be able to simulate uh, how to design better batteries, how to, uh, those kind of things. So um, now Harmit thinks that uh, in order for a computer to be conscious, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on the, the sort of theoretical views of what consciousness really is, how do we define it, um, so he tried to bridge a little bit of Roger's position, saying, you know, you could put a quantum computer inside biology, for example, and maybe that would boost consciousness or that might affect consciousness in a way. But these three perspectives were a nice way to get the conference started right. because it sort of frames the debate moving forward for the rest of the week. Excellent. Okay. And this is a perennial debate. We've heard the, we've been engaging in this discussion for several years now, um, wh whether consciousness is computational or fundamental or mm -hmm. product of brains or could be replicated in quantum computers. Mm -hmm. Nobody seems to be sure or really getting closer to an ultimate answer, but the question is still absolutely fascinating and, and, and driving us all forward. Right. So uh, thank you, Cameron, very much for that. And we'll look forward to hearing to what happened on the second day tomorrow. Right. at uh, Science of Consciousness here in San Diego. Hello, I am Dorian Electra, and here we are at the Science of Consciousness Conference 2017, where I am interviewing some of the most amazing minds. What is your name? Flavio, Flavio Burgarella. From, from Italy, I'm very happy to be here. I'm a cardiologist, I run a cardiac rehabilitation center in Italy and stay here to present my organization, the school Bulgarella Quantum Healing, and try to put the principle of the physical, quantum physical in the medical clinic. What is your name? My name is Yumi Ogawa. And where are you from? I am originally from Japan, but I live in San Diego. Awesome. And uh, what do you do? I'm a massage therapist and shiatsu, so I'm very familiar with the energy, and I have a lot of followers in Japan and Europe. Amazing. And what brings you to the Science of Consciousness Conference? Well, a lot of people are wondering where is the consciousness and how does it work. Even though me, I want to understand why I have a psychic ability to find out what what's their concern or problems or where's the pain. I want to understand myself too. Hi, what's your name? Leah. And uh, what has been your favorite part of the conference so far? Well, I think my favorite part has been um, one of the talks about like dreams and games was really cool. My name is Nama Kostiner. And what do you do and what brings you to the Science of Consciousness Conference? Many things. First of all, it's not the first time and I love it. And I talk about consciousness, arts, and psychology. We had a very interesting panel the other day. 
Yes, we did. So I'm all this, all of this playing around, but I don't know what you do. That's actually a lie because we were on the same panel together. So, <laughs> hello, Stuart. How's it going? Dorian, it's going great. It's great to have you back at the Science of Consciousness. We couldn't do this without you. Dorian Electron, the Electrodes will be performing tomorrow night. I hope you do all your favorites like. The mind body problem, uh, what Mary didn't know, and hopefully it's a movie stick, right? That's right, I got lots of new tricks up my sleeve. Okay, well, we look forward to hearing and seeing them tomorrow. Thank you. You got some costumes lined up? Tons of costumes, and I can't wait for you to see them. Thanks for bringing me back, Stuart. All right. All right. So that just about wraps today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it. Join us again tomorrow for another edition of Consciousness Central.